This is Franklin Rye, and welcome back to Political Spirits. We still stand for the proposition that the left and the right should have a few drinks and talk. Compromise is not a requirement. If those discussions result in us changing or even abandoning our positions, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. We just need to talk to each other. In that way, we can unify through speech. And if the discussion becomes a bit heated, at the end of the night, we should still be able to split up the bar tab and be on our way. So what are we going to talk about this week? Well, the biggest news is the completion of the Mueller investigation and the submission of his report to the Department of Justice. The fact that it included no more indictments is huge. The primary findings will be released to Congress shortly, but every outlet is reporting that there has been no finding of collusion by the Trump administration with Russia. Indeed, if there were such a finding, how could there possibly not be additional indictments? So what does this mean? Well, the first thing it means is that the Trump administration has a huge win. President Trump has been saying from the start that there was no collusion with Russia, and he's been referring to the investigation as a witch hunt seemingly for an eternity. To say that the ending of this investigation is a weight off the shoulders of the administration would be the understatement of the decade. This is, of course, a huge win for the Trump administration, but it's also a huge loss for the Democrat Party, and perhaps even more so for the news media. I've been disturbed by the conduct of the media for years, and I've talked about it extensively on this podcast, starting with Episode 3, Bursting the Bubble. In covering the Mueller investigation, there have been so many instances of purported bombshells, breaking news that will be a disaster for the Trump administration, that are later retracted or proven false but never retracted, that I've lost track of them. But one journalist, who I'll mention in a moment, has kept track of them, and there have been more than 50. Now, it's been fun to watch the news media meltdown over the end of the Mueller investigation, including Rachel Maddow apparently fighting back tears on her program. But what we really need is an honest, detailed evaluation of what went wrong with the news media on this issue and how it has destroyed what was left of its reputation. Well, I have found that honest, detailed evaluation, and it comes from a source so clearly on the left side of the fence that nobody can claim that he's biased in favor of the Trump administration. The author and journalist Matt Taby's most recent book is about Donald Trump and the 2016 election and is entitled Insane Clown President. Nobody would mistake him for a fan of Donald Trump. Taby's been a frequent guest on Real Time with Bill Maher and has appeared on The Rachel Maddow Show and other MSNBC programming. He's a fixture on left-wing media, and he's also appeared on the Fox Business Network. Most of my exposure to Taby has been as a result of his reporting on the bursting of the real estate bubble and the resultant recession. His July 2009 article in Rolling Stone entitled The Great American Bubble Machine may be his most famous work. So where can you find this honest, detailed evaluation by Matt Taby of the failures of the news media regarding the Mueller investigation? Well, you can find it as a link to Instapundit on March 24, and as a link to HotAir.com and RealClearPolitics.com on March 25. It takes you to Hate.Inc., quote, How the Press Makes Us Hate One Another, close quote, his serial book. The title of the article itself, which is a chapter from the book, is It's Official, Russiagate is This Generation's WMD. The chapter begins, quote, Nobody wants to hear this, but news that Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller is headed home without issuing any new charges is a death blow for the reputation of the American news media. As he notes, there will be no conspiracy charges or collusion with Russia charges that would wreck Trump's presidency. Taby goes through examples of the multiple instances where the media breathlessly reported developments that would doom Trump to prison or removal from office, such as reporting in The Independence that a former NSA analyst, John Schindler, advised that he had received an email from a senior intelligence agent stating that President Trump would, quote, die in jail, close quote. 
He noted that CNN had told us that Trump officials have been in, quote, constant contact, close quote, with, quote, Russians known to U.S. intelligence, close quote. As Matt Taby makes clear, there should be a reckoning because, quote, we broke every written and unwritten rule in pursuit of this story, starting with the prohibition on reporting things we can't confirm, close quote. He draws parallels between the reporting of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and the Russiagate reporting, with the unsupported tales told by Ahmed Shalabi regarding WMDs being replaced by the dossier put together by supposedly respected former British spy Christopher Steele, which had been funded by the Democratic National Committee through the law firm Perkins Coy. Given the prominence of the WMD issue among Democrats frustrated with the George W. Bush administration, the fact that Taby so convincingly draws that parallel should cause every Democrat that reads this article to engage in some real soul-searching. We've all heard the tales told in the dossier, and we've all read that Christopher Steele was supposedly reliable. Taby tears apart the credibility of the dossier with a simple examination of the claims in it and the way that some of them seem too perfectly crafted for the receiving audience. One of the tidbits about the way the Steele dossier was put together that's discussed in the article is that Christopher Steele had included information from a 2009 posting on CNN's iReports page about XBT Webzilla, a Russian tech company, which the dossier claims was involved in hacking. Incredibly, Steele admitted in sworn testimony in a court case, a defamation suit, that he didn't know that the iReports posting come from members of the general public, not CNN journalists. In other words, this supposedly well-respected British spy used unverified postings from the general public on an online forum as support for at least one of the claims made in the dossier. Just think for a moment about some of the things that you've seen posted on Twitter or any online forum and wrap your head around the fact that one of those was used in the production of a dossier from which an investigation sprung which has consumed much of the media and has hamstrung over two years of a presidency. The longer I live, the more I seem to encounter instances where those who were supposedly worthy of respect and held in high esteem are deserving of neither. Frankly, I'm getting tired of it. Taby makes an observation about the current nature of the news media divide, which gets right to the heart of why I always stress that you have to go to some media sources which have a different opinion or point of view than your own. You must not live in a bubble. He notes that often when the original claims about Russiagate in the media ended up going sideways, quote, the original outlets simply ignore the new developments, leaving the retraction process to conservative audiences that don't reach the original audiences. Close quote. In that instance, if you're not reading Breitbart or The Daily Caller, for example, you may never learn that the article that got you worked up and convinced that someone in the Trump administration had done something horribly wrong was actually way off base. Now, those on the left would say you can't read Breitbart or The Daily Caller because they're biased and not reliable. But what this scandal has proven is that almost all media, at least at the national level, is biased in some way, and you have to look to both sides to try to sort it out and get the full picture. If you don't, you've chosen to live in a bubble. You've selected willful ignorance as your preferred state. He also tells a story about his encounter with a journalist from a left-wing publication where Taby took the position that the obligation of a journalist is to avoid, quote, things that may not be true, close quote, and that as journalists they had responsibilities that may be different from the responsibility of someone that is just a Democrat. The journalist responded that policing the Trump opposition was, quote, just not high on my personal list, close quote, of things that need to be covered. I read that as clearly stating that what was high on his list was fighting against the Trump administration, and in doing so, he was not willing to investigate or fact-check the claims of the opposition. He tells another story of a writer for The New Yorker who was reluctant to express concerns about the way the story was reported because it, quote, could risk giving fodder to Trump and his allies, close quote. Think about that for a moment. 
That's a journalist openly acknowledging his hesitation about upholding journalistic ethics and the search for actual truth if doing so might help Trump. Think about what that means. We've historically held up journalism as an honorable profession. We recognize that it's critical to speak truth to power. But if the profession isn't committed to speaking truth, but rather is simply committed to pursuit of its own politics, then it as a profession is no more worthy of respect or honor than a random person spouting political opinions in a bar, on Twitter, or in any public forum. And that's a shame. It reminds me of a scene from the movie Frost Nixon. Near the end of the movie, after interviewer David Frost is able to extract an apology from Richard Nixon to the American people, the producer of the interview, John Burt, strips off his clothes and runs naked into the ocean in celebration. The news media has always referenced Richard Nixon as an example of an unethical politician who thought that the ends justify the means, an example of someone so corrupt that he shamed and disgraced the greatest office in the land. Well, the irony here is that the news media is playing the role of Richard Nixon. It is they who have shamed one of the great pillars of a democratic society. They have shamed journalism. And the ending of the Mueller probe with no further indictments is the moment where that has been shown. Will the news media apologize to America for what they've done? Not likely. Would I strip naked and jump in the ocean if they did? Even less likely. I have too much respect for my neighbors. Next topic. What's up with all the socialism? Well, let's talk about something that came up in a discussion I was having recently with some friends. The question raised was, how did we reach a point where Democrats appear to be giving serious consideration to multiple candidates that either proudly proclaim their socialists or support socialism or who refuse to endorse capitalism? Now, we can talk about what's been going on in the educational system for decades, the movement away from celebrating the accomplishments of America and instead focusing on its faults, almost to the exclusion of all else. We can talk about the disproportionate representation of liberals among the teachers and professors in the educational system, and even more disproportionate representation among college-level administrators. But given that the question raised was focused on the presidential race, my response was directed more towards our recent experience with presidential races, which I think explains in significant part why the Democratic Party's willingness to identify with socialism and disavow capitalism has increased among those running for the nomination. Bill Clinton is a brilliant politician, a deeply flawed one, but brilliant nevertheless. He was elected in 1992, frankly because Ross Perot chose to run as an independent and took just enough votes from George H.W. Bush to allow Clinton to win. As has happened with many Democrats, when Clinton took office, the left wing of the party pressed hard for its agenda, and Clinton moved to the left. Among other things, pushing an assault weapons ban through the Democrat-controlled Congress and unsuccessfully pursuing a complicated health care package which came to be known by many as Hillary Care. In the midterm elections of 1994, the Democratic Party suffered a horrible defeat in what came to be known as the Republican Revolution. The Republicans picked up majorities in both the House of Representatives and the Senate, as well as governorships. They gained eight Senate seats and 54 House seats. The lesson taken from the loss by many in politics was that Clinton's move to the left precipitated the losses, at least in part. The logic is held since then with many commentators and not just those on the right. So the logic has been, if you move too far toward the extreme within your party, you risk a backlash because you've now made it easier for your opponents to claim the center. What did Bill Clinton do in response when his party suffered that tremendous loss? He chose to work with the Republican Congress, including adopting policies of fiscal responsibility, signing a landmark welfare reform bill, and generally moving back towards the center. 
He famously announced in his 1996 State of the Union address that, quote, the era of big government is over, close quote. Bill Clinton was able to win re-election and end his second term as a popular president. Over time, his shift to the center has been widely viewed as a smart political move, which helped ensure his re-election. When Barack Obama was elected, I hadn't voted for him, but I held out hope that he would move to the center. I wouldn't say I predicted that he would do so, but rather I simply hoped he would do so, and I periodically tried to reassure myself that he would. But instead, he most certainly didn't make that shift to the center. Instead, he used the filibuster-proof 60 votes that the Democrats held in the Senate until the election of Scott Brown to Ted Kennedy's former seat to pass Obamacare. He also pursued adoption of a virtual monopoly in the federal government on student loans, replacing the prior system in which the government backed private lenders on student loans. Instead of reducing the volume of debt as projected, it skyrocketed. So what happened? The Republicans picked up an incredible 63 seats in the House to gain control, as well as picking up seven Senate seats to reduce the Democrat margin there. Additionally, Republicans gained six gubernatorial slots. Using the approach of Bill Clinton, President Obama's reaction should have been to move towards the center and work with the Republican House. But he didn't do that. He did take responsibility for the loss. He did say that he was going to work with the newly elected Republican House, but he generally stuck to his positions. And he advised that he would not entertain any changes to Obamacare other than minor tweaks. If the belief that you had to follow the Bill Clinton model after suffering a severe midterm defeat was correct, then Barack Obama should have lost the 2012 election. But he didn't. Why? Because Barack Obama drove turnout numbers in key Democratic constituencies. He was perhaps most effective at driving African American turnout. He was able to effectively use identity politics, primarily through surrogates, to avoid damaging his own image. He also ran a campaign that was extremely accurate in, in its decision-making as to where to focus resources. In fact, the campaign so effectively spotlighted the states on which to focus that if you close the popular vote margin across the country equally on a state-by-state -state basis so that if Mitt Romney had won the popular vote by a slight margin, Barack Obama would still have won the electoral vote by a substantial margin. In other words, Barack Obama would have pulled off in 2012 what Donald Trump pulled off in 2016 if the popular vote numbers had not been there in 2012. So what lesson did that teach the Democrats? I think it taught them that they could run to the left rather than the center and by driving turnout in their core constituencies, effectively using identity politics, and correctly distributing their resources, they could still win at the national level. And because the left of the Democrat Party is so energized by their opposition to Trump and the hint of left-wing leadership they got under President Obama, Democrat Party leadership may have a hard time pushing candidates back towards the center. Moreover, because of the surprising numbers racked up by Bernie Sanders in the 2016 campaign, even while the Democrat Party was undermining him at nearly every turn, and the disturbing courtship of socialism among the youth of America, when you move to the left in the current Democrat Party, you end up embracing socialism. As a result, Barack Obama's success in the 2012 election has set the Democratic Party on a course where multiple candidates speak highly of socialism or identify as socialists and are reluctant to endorse capitalism. The stakes in the 2020 election are huge. I pray that President Trump and the Republican Party are victorious. Next topic. Just give it the old college crime. Unless you've been living under a rock for the last couple of weeks, you've heard about the college admission scandal. Fifty people have been arrested for allegedly being part of a scheme to cheat on college admissions tests and to cheat on college admissions forms for premier universities 
by falsely listing incoming students as athletes. Among those arrested were several famous parents, including two Hollywood actresses, Lori Laughlin, who played Aunt Becky on Full House, and Felicity Huffman from Desperate Housewives. Some parents involved in the scheme allegedly obtained an opinion from a doctor that their children had a medical need for additional time to take the SAT or ACT college admissions tests, and then use others to assist with or take the test. Parents would also purportedly falsely claim that their children applying to college were athletes, such as members of the crew or water polo teams, thus trying to take advantage of a relaxation of testing or grade standards for athletes. There were college athletic department members, including coaches, who were allegedly part of the scheme and received huge bribes to participate. Now this scandal has been covered extensively on the network news, cable news, and across the internet. The specific angle I want to talk about is the role that college plays in society. Quite frankly, it's become absurdly elevated. It's time that we all start asking ourselves whether the elevated status that we give graduates from certain colleges is warranted. It seems that for many of them, unless you're studying in one of the STEM fields, the hardest thing about them is getting in. Those that do get in often seem to simply fall into a B because of severe grade inflation. In that respect, some of the purportedly lesser institutions might actually be more difficult from a grade perspective than the supposedly elite institutions. I remember when I attended graduate school at a southern university that's well-respected, but certainly not the equivalent of an Ivy League college, they used to publicly state that if you made a 3.0 at that graduate school, you would make a 3.0 at the same graduate school at Harvard. The difference being that a 3.0 at the graduate school I attended would put you in the upper rankings of the class, but at Harvard it would be a run-of-the-mill grade. It makes me wonder whether we should consider attendance at an elite institution as really that impressive if you don't rank near the top of your class. With regard to the present scandal, I understand that parents want the best for their kids, and that can sometimes prompt them to go too far and they certainly seem to have gone too far in this instance. But with some of these parents who are so well off, this incident should have prompted some real soul-searching. Lori Laughlin's daughter, Olivia Jade, was a well-known YouTube personality, an influencer on social media. By all indications, she was well on her way to significant financial success and was doing work which she enjoyed. Some publications, including L.com, report that she's, quote, really angry, close quote, that her parents, quote, ruined everything, close quote, by, quote, making her go to college, close quote. If she didn't know about what they did, this is really sad. Moreover, with an extremely wealthy mother and extremely wealthy father and a daughter doing work that she enjoys and which was financially lucrative, you have to wonder whether they pushed her to attend USC for her benefit, or was it for their benefit? As a parent, we must always ask ourselves whether we're keeping our kids' best interests in mind. I have no doubt that Olivia Jade's parents must be asking themselves that very question right now. When you ask yourself what podcast to listen to, I hope you always answer with confidence and enthusiasm, political spirits, of course. I look forward to speaking with you next week with confidence and enthusiasm when I release the next episode. Until then, be sure to tell your friends about political spirits and follow me on Twitter at Franklin Rye. This is Franklin Rye. Thank you for listening.